Hello everyone! This video is all about the assigned Western art of the group 2. Hello everyone, my name is Aysen Lois Kuyus. I'm here right now to discuss about mannerism. So when you first look at the mannerist painting, you might be tempted to think that it's a product of Italian Renaissance. You might be right or you might be wrong because mannerism is a period of art that came out of the high Renaissance in Italy and is also known as the late Renaissance period. It lasted from 1520s to 1580s. The influence of the Renaissance style is clear to the paintings of the Mannerist movement. There are figures from religion and mythology, rich of colors, and careful details of all of which you would expect from the art of his age. But when you look again, you discover that some things is little off. So upon closer inspection, you realize that the figures are distorted. Because in high Renaissance art, it is like an idealized nature where the proportions, symmetry, grace, and stability is quite perfect for me. While in the mannerism, it is augmented nature where the elongations, the asymmetry, the tension, and the instability of art. You can observe that in mannerism, the neck of a person is, the neck of the person is so long. No human can maintain that distorted pose no one's skin is that bright, the lines are kind of exaggerated, and the geographical setting is unclear. Also, the space is quite strange. That is when you realize that it's not a Renaissance art, but rather mannerism. The manners know what they were doing when they created this. Slightly odd images and presented them as genuine, distorting elements such as a scale and perspective, adding drama in subtle ways where wherever they could wear exactly the look we're going for. The name mannerism came directly from the first no known art from first known art historian Giorgio Vasari. Giorgio himself was a mannerist artist and used the Italian term manera, an Italian term for style or manner. It refers to a stylized, exaggerated approach to paintings and sculpture. Hello, I am Rex and I will continue the topic Mannerism. Mannerist artists departed from the ideals of mathematical, anatomical, and even scenic perfection of the Renaissance in breaking these rules and depicting unrealistic body proportions, possess colors, and settings. They opened imaginative possibilities for juxtaposed scenes vibrant color and perfect elegance. Mannerist paintings are often filled with tension rather than depicting an important scene or action. They frequently show the moment just before the action takes place. Consider Tintoretto and his painting of the Last Supper depicted from almost an offstage viewpoint. It is darker or more fraught with suspense than the Vinci's more famous painting of the same scene. The lighting is more harsh and surreal, there are more figures off to the side and distorted poses, and elongated angels wash from above, all distinctly mannerist characteristics. Raphael and Michelangelo are well-known painters of the Italian Renaissance, were also among the first artists to experiment with painting in a mannerist style. Francesco Mesola, more commonly known as Parma Ginanino, followed these Renaissance heroes example and become one of the first characteristically mannerist painters. Parmigianino's self-portrait in a convict mirror shows the artist painting his own distorted figure. The painting entombment by Jacopo Pontormo features an unnaturally elongated Christ and surrounding figures bent and posed uncomfortably unlike many Renaissance paintings entombment is not didactic with a specific dogmatic message 
in mind but invites contemplation and opens itself up to interpretation. As with most trends in exaggeration mannerism could only last only so long by the close of the 1500s, it was yielding to the less strange, highly detailed, and more theatrical arts of the Baroque movement too. to you the Baroque period art. So the Baroque period art has a rather fascinating beginning. During the mid-1500s, the Catholic Church was feeling threatened by the increasing conversion of the population to Lutheranism. The Church convened the Council of Trent, which took place from 1545 to 1563 at the Council of Trent Religious Reforms. Were being questioned, proposed, and reconsidered Martin Luther's catching criticism, of the church found supporters everywhere. So as a response, the church launched an advertising glitch, reiterating and reaffirming its fundamental teachings to combat the Protestant criticisms that were turning the public away from the Catholic Church. Since winning over the few educated intellectuals who were able to read at the time would not make a big difference in attaining the power of the Catholic Church, the uneducated masses were targeted. And since majority of people could not be reached via the written word to inspire them to stay loyal to the Catholic Church, and its teaching would require a medium that did not require literacy, the answer to this was clear. The Church embarked on a systematic religious advertising campaign using art. This marked the beginning of the Baroque era. In the 1600s, the Baroque style became prevalent among artists in Rome and Italy. And Baroque works filled with religious grandeur spread to other parts of Europe until the 1750s. Artists were now being actively encouraged to express their faith through grand and beautiful artworks. Baroque art celebrated intense personal visions, conversions, religions, visions, death, and even martyrdom. The images Baroque artists created were realistic, intense, and extravagant. Vivid use of color was becoming a more dramatic feature, and different elements and figures of a composition could be overlapped instead of being isolated in the center of the work. In his early years, the term Baroque was actually derogatory to call something Baroque meant that it was considered overly exaggerated and filled with unflattering details like warts and wrinkles. This offended viewers and critics who were used to the painstaking realism of the Renaissance. Baroque artists typically painted pictures that captured the ultimate dramatic moments that showed unfolding events taking place in a real time. During the Baroque years, among this are famous names such as Rembrandt, Rubens, Paulsons, Caravaggio, Vermeer, and Velázquez. Rembrandt was a true master of Baroque art techniques. You can observe his exceptional use of light and shadow. Today, his brilliant brushstrokes in Key 9 can be seen when looking at any of the masterpieces that he created during the 17th century. Poisson's religious paintings were didactic in nature. They were meant to teach moral lessons to students and persuade them of the importance of biblical and classic mythological events. The adoration of the Magi depicting the three kings bearing gifts to the baby messiah and the adoration of the golden calf illustrating a celebration of worshippers dancing around a false idol were two of Poisson's best-known biblical paintings meant to help viewers contemplate lessons of Christian righteousness and sin. The piece depicts the scene where St. Peter impaled on the crucifix is being lifted by three Romans after his request to be positioned upside down. Body language depicted in each of the figures in this masterpiece speaks volumes about the artist's skills. The strain of lifting Peter is very evident in the stance of the three men showing that the sheer magnitude of their crime is weighing them down. Saint Peter's face is bathed in divine light glorifying him without impinging on the drama and emotion of the scene. One thing is very clear when you look at the artwork created by these Baroque masters. Their objective was to evoke the spirituality within to encourage the viewer to 
connect with the scene that was depicted and to cement belief in God's compassion for mankind. They sought to create a scene that was larger than life spiritually and capable of evoking a sense of awe. All of it was done with one goal to communicate in a grandiose, glamorous manner a strong religious message to the masses. The Rococo movement was an artistic period that emerged in France and spread throughout the world in the late 17th and early 18th century. The word is our derivative of the French term roquet, which means rock and shell garden ornamentation. Painting during the Rococo period has many of the same qualities as other Rococo art forms such as heavy use of ornament curved lines, and the use of a gold and pastel-based palais. Additionally, forms are often asymmetrical and the themes are playful, even witty, rather than political, as in the case of the Baroque art. Themes related to myths of love as well as portraits in idyllic landscapes typify Rococo painting. Jean Honor Fragonard was one such painter who attempted to adapt his style to artistic changes of the period. Today, Fragonard is best known for his Rococo-style paintings like La Coquette Fixie or The Fascinated Coquette, which depicts an enormous encounter between a female and two males. The last full male gaze established the female figure as the focal point of the painting. As a work of light-hearted entertainment, there is no complex meaning or story behind the piece. It is a bright, cheerful scene meant for amusement and delight. Neoclassical art emerged in the 1760s and was popular throughout Europe and North America until the 1850s. Breaking away from the emotionally charged Baroque style of previous years, neoclassical artists would look back to the classical style of art. Neoclassical art can sometimes appear cold and unemotional, but in fact, some of the most popular neoclassical themes were emotional subjects like patriotism, sacrifice, and courage. Renaissance neoclassical style is known for its formal composition, accurate detail, and solid lines, which sometimes came at the expense of lighting and atmosphere. It is also known for its classical and mythological themes with contemporary settings and costumes. Common themes included patriotism honor and human rights. Archaeology was a brand new science at the time and it sparked public interest in all things and the discovery of ruins of ancient cities like Pompeii gave modern viewers the opportunity to see ancient art for themselves. Simplicity and self-grandeur marked the art of these ancient cultures and with its rediscovery, it quickly came back into vogue. Both artists and the public at large were captivated by the classical style of Greco-Roman art. Neoclassical artists did not need to be persuaded and even competed among themselves to produce the best imitations of the Greco-Roman style. For both Greek and Roman style inspired imitations throughout the neoclassical period. However, since far more examples of Roman sculpture remain this style with the sculptors of the dead. Many sculptors actually insisted that their subjects were Roman style clothing to capture the essence of Roman style, despite their idealization of the Roman aesthetic. Neoclassical artists depicted the flaws of their subjects as ancient Greco-Roman artists would never do. For Greco-Roman artists have valued ideal looks and form as opposed to realism, but neoclassical artists tended to make some allowances in that respect. One of the leading sculptors of this age, Jean Antoine Houdon, created a statue of George Washington. Fortunately, he did not depict the president wearing a Roman toga or sporting a Greek godlike physique. 
The statue can still be seen today in Virginia State Capitol's Rotunda. The Oath of the Jackies Louis David, who is considered one of the most important artists of the neoclassical era, modeled his soldiers on the lines of the ideal Greek warrior represented in so many classical works. The focus was once again on the ideal human form David, was immensely impressed with the ancient art uncovered at Pompeii. In his work, it is clearly reflected this in literature and social tradition. The neoclassical movement can be described as an offshoot of the Age of Enlightenment, which began in the late 70th century. The neoclassical movement swept through the architectural world as well as the Arc de Triomphe. It is one of the most easily recognized structures in the world. It is a classic example of how the Roman Empire's architecture was imitated by neoclassical architects. Typically, the neoclassical architect was likely to focus on simple geometric forms while ensuring that buildings' proportions were of a grand scale. Modern-day examples of neoclassical architecture stretch across continents to include the White House in Washington. The neoclassical movement spread all over the world to some degree towards the end of the 90th century. The neoclassical school of thought coexisted with Romanticism, a new artistic style which was just beginning to emerge you. Hi, I'm Elena. I'm the one who will summarize of all the topics. Manners painting tends to be more artificial and less naturalistic than Renaissance painting. This exaggerated idiom is typically associated with attributes such as emotionalism, elongated human figures, trained possess, usually effects of scale, lightning or perspective, and also vivid often garish color. Second, will baroque or grandeur, sensuous richness, drama, dynamism, movement, tension, emotionally exuberance and a tendency to blur distinctions between the various arts. The third is the Rococo style is characterized by elaborate ornamentations, asymmetrical values, pastel color palette, and curved or serpentine lines. Rococo art works often depicts themes of love, classical myths, youth, and playfulness. And lastly, neoclassical is characterized by the use of straight line, a smooth paint surface, the depiction of light, a minimal use of color, and the clear grips definition of forms.